I realized that over the last couple of weeks, it's been incredibly difficult for our black brothers and sisters. And of course that includes those who are members of St. Mary's. I want to say today that black lives do matter. And whether or not you've felt it or not, the words of John Boyega, the actor, do ring true when he said last week, black lives have always mattered. But if those words are going to become more than just words, I believe it's really important for us to start a conversation, to listen to each other, and especially for us to listen to our black members so that they can express some of their experiences and feelings, perhaps even within the church. And I realize that that isn't going to be easy at times, but in order to facilitate that, we're going to have a number of groups, and the first of which will be this coming week. And we'd like to invite everyone in the church to join that group, which will be on Zoom. It'll be black led and it'll be an opportunity for us to hear from our black brothers and sisters. I do hope that you can come. There will be more information on this over the next couple of days. And so now I'd like to just hand over to Gretchen who's going to welcome you to our worship this morning. Thank you. Good morning everybody and welcome to our online service for St. Mary Magdalene Church this morning. My name is Gretchen and I'm going to be making some introductory remarks as, as leader of the service today and then the blessing at the end. This is week 13 of lockdown and I think everybody has their own lockdown story to tell, their own challenges that's happened to them since the pandemic took hold of, of our country. And one of the things that's been bothering me especially this week is my hair is just too long and it's making me crazy and it's making me feel unacceptable and it's making me just feel not who I really am. And I've noticed that a number of times in, in different situations in my family. One of my grandchildren is in year four and he's got a brother who's in year six and another brother who's in reception. They can go to school and he can't and it's making him feel bad, it's making him feel like he's in trouble, um, even though we explain it to him. There's something about this that, that's making him feel very inauthentic, very not who he is. And as I said, I think everybody does have their, their own story to tell about this, about feeling unacceptable, about feeling alienated from ourselves. But one of the messages that we know as Christians is that we are children of God, we are acceptable in God's sight, not because of who we are or what we've done, but because of God's grace through Jesus Christ, which means that we're all children of God. And just to remind you about the many times in the Bible where acceptance is one of the things that we are taught about, about our profound, unconditional acceptability in the eyes of God. In John 14, 6, it says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to be children of God. So as children of God, let's worship this morning to the glory of our Lord, who gave us this unconditional love, this unconditional acceptance. What a thing to celebrate. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that took my heart to fear, and grace my 
fish relieved How precious did that grace
things that has always struck me about the redeemed is this incredible commitment to prayer which I think goes right back to the beginning of the church's history these all-night prayer meetings this um, disciplined continual prayer of coming to 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 meet God um, when we pray in whichever way we do thy kingdom come what do you think 
is happening? What do you think the response of God is? Well, I think um, it's interesting because I just did a, a study um, around the theme, um, does God answer prayers? <laughs> and um, I think I was actually probably surprised myself at the overwhelming evidence in the scriptures that God answers prayers. And so I, I, I'm encouraging as many people as will listen and just saying to them, God, God does answer prayers. When we pray, uh, we're praying to a God who listens and a God who answers. He might not answer it the way we want, <laughs> but, but, but answer it he will. Um, so, yeah. I mean, if I pick up that thought, because I think that's, that's really quite an interesting one and a very important one. You know, I get letters from people every year after Thy Kingdom comes saying, how do I pray for my brother, my son, my daughter, my mother, my husband, my wife? I've been praying for them for years and years and, you know, I, they still haven't become Christians. What am I doing wrong? What would you say to them? You're not doing anything wrong. Just I'd, I'd, I'd encourage them to, to persevere, to hold on, to keep praying, to keep believing. Um, one of the things that we get out of prayer, um, in addition to the answer eventually, is that prayer actually changes the person praying. Mm. So you, it deepens your faith, your trust in God. Um, you, 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 get, you get, in addition to the answer to the prayer, the reward of prayer is that you get more of God. And, I mean, thinking about that, and one of the great examples of prayer that I've heard you talking about very recently was uh, Elijah praying for the end to the drought. Um, I mean, that passage has been on your heart a bit from the Old Testament, hasn't it? Yes, it has, certainly. I mean, what struck you about that? Because I think Elijah was changed by that. Yes, I think what, what a number of things struck me. I think the fact that um, he'd heard this sound of rain, so he had some sort of promise from God that he was holding on to. But when he starts praying, uh, the servant goes to look for the sign that the prayer has been answered, which would be the cloud. Um, and the servant comes back six times to say there is nothing. And it, it, that must have been very demoralizing. Mm. For, for, for the prophet who was believing God. And we go through that in life where we're praying and we're holding on and the circumstances are saying very loudly, there is nothing, um, it's, this is a waste of time. But I guess the, 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 the moral in the story is that he just held on and just continued praying. Um, and the seventh time, the servant comes back and this time he doesn't come back with the same, there is nothing. He comes back to say something is happening on the horizon, which means it's still a distance, a distance away, but something is happening. There's a cloud the size of a man's fist that's rising on the horizon. So I think that speaks to us as we pray, especially um, with thy kingdom come, that we just, we just hold on, we just keep praying, we just believe that, that at some point God will respond and answer our prayers. I mean, it's fascinating because each of these, I've been talking to a number of Christian leaders and all the things they've said have been complimentary without you know, adding to one another, without in any sense being preset. I hadn't told you what they'd said, but your message is persevere. Yes. Just keep at it. Yes, we, we have no choice. <laughs> we just have to. We, we have, <laughs> well, that is certainly true. I, 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 do. No I, I quite often feel that. Yes. Well, thank you very, very much indeed, Agu. It's very kind. And uh, uh, I pray that God will bless your churches as they join in this, as he's blessing us. Thank you. Thank you. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, 
If I have found favour in your eyes, my lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be bought, and then you may all wash your feet under the trees. Let me get something for you to eat. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent. Quick, he said, get to the seers of the finest flour and knead and bake some bread. Then he ran and got a herd and selected a choice of tender calf and gave it to the servant who hurried to prepare it. He ran and bought some curds and milk and a calf and prepared. While they ate, he stood near under the tree. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return you next time this year and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah was already old and Sarah was past age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself and thought, after I'm worn out and the Lord has made me old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return and be appointed this time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. The Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 9, verse 35 to chapter 10, verse 8. The workers are few. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus sends out the twelve. He called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve. First Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles, or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, preach this message, the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to thee, O Christ. Earlier this week, I was reading the book that I referred to, referred to earlier, which is Pete Gregg's book, How to Pray. And uh, I read the following words. After decades of night and day prayer, I have come to believe that 99% of it is just turning up. At the time I shared that, I was actually quite reassured and encouraged when I think about the times that I've struggled to get up early in the morning, maybe at 5.30 in the morning, to pray with other people here at St Mary's. We have a Wednesday morning prayer meeting. And often you feel like you're, you're asleep. Actually, the whole time, almost through the prayer meeting, you feel like you're asleep. And afterwards you come out of it, you think, oh, what did I pray about? But the thing is, 
That's very reassuring to hear that maybe 99% of what, of what we do when we pray is actually turning up and being with God. Because you ask the question, don't you? You say, is it worth it? Does it really make a difference at all to pray? And uh, of course, Abraham must have felt uh, in a, sim a similar way. As I mentioned a few moments ago, Abraham and Sarah are held up to be hero heroes of faith especially Abraham in the Bible. And in fact, we read in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, about Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Abraham was a hero of faith. Would you like to be a hero of faith? I'm going to assume now that you have a relationship with God. But if you don't have a relationship with God, of course, that's still possible. And if we're open to God, he will reveal himself to us. As Pete Gregg said a moment ago, sometimes we just have to turn up. But as we turn up, as we're open to God, he will speak to us. But Abraham and Sarah were known as heroes of faith. In fact, reading on in Hebrews chapter 11, we read this. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because, it, because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. Abraham and Sarah have been called by the theologian Walter Brueggemann, models of doubt. They must have been tired. Let's face it, Abraham was 100 years old, Sarah was 99, and he'd been promised that he would have a son. But it hadn't happened. But in the background is that promise. The promise was always there. And the promise expressed in different ways. In the promise of a land that he would enter, um, a promise of a child that would be born, a promise that his descendants would be more numerous than the stars in the sky. So Abraham, in spite of his doubts, somehow still held on to the promise, the promise of God. And that brings us to the next point, which is the presence of God. Because in the reading that we just had from Genesis chapter 18, Verses 1 to 3, we read this. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. It's a hot and lazy day. Abraham is sitting outside his tent. As Pete Gregg continues, just turning up, is making the effort to become consciously present to the God who is constantly present. So God is present and Abraham is there in a sense just waiting on God and then three strangers appear. And actually God comes into his doubts and, and his insecurity about the promise that was made to him God reveals himself to him. And that's what God does. It's often in the times of desolation, desperation, in situations where change doesn't seem possible, in hopelessness that God reveals himself. And so he does to Abraham and Sarah. But for them, what has become normal is Desolation, desperation, hopelessness. 
In fact, again reading from Brueggemann, Brueggemann says that they are resigned to their closed future. Just as Sarah believes that her womb is closed, they believe that their future is closed. How can the promise ever be delivered at this late stage in their lives? And in a sense that's relevant to us today as well, as we think about those words, that they were resigned to a closed future. What are we resigned to? Gretchen reminded us that we're in the 13th week of lockdown and we've had terrible things happen over the last few weeks. The murder of George Floyd, unrest and, and difficulties, animosity between different people and also just in the lockdown situation we must be wondering what does the future hold as we look into a future that perhaps is going to be economically challenging socially challenging. Can we put our faith in God at times like this? Well, I believe it is relevant to have faith in God, to have the faith of Abraham, to follow his example, to, and of course to follow the example of Jesus, as I'll come on to in a moment. But that brings me to the second thing, which is possibility. Because in Genesis chapter 18, verses 9 to 10, we read about a new possibility. The strangers who have arrived say to Abraham, where is your wife, Sarah? There in the tent, he said. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you but about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. It's a new possibility. It mustn't seem much like a possibility, maybe an impossibility to them. It is there nevertheless that these strangers are saying that they're going to come back in a year's time and there's going to be a baby has been born. But if we read on uh, in verses 11 to 12, it says, Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? She laughed just as Abraham had laughed. Uh, further back in, in the, a couple of chapters before this, uh, Abraham is told the same thing and he just cracked up laughing. He thought, how can this happen? But I just want to read to you a little bit from a book called The Divine Conspiracy by a man called Dallas Willard. He's talking about laughter, because laughter is a, is a great thing. In fact, Dallas Willard in this book says, laughter is so good for our health. It's even a symbol of redemption. So in fact, Dallas Willard is saying that, that even the laughter is a sign of, of something more that is going to come. He says, there is no greater incongruity in all creation than redemption. When deliverance comes, we are like those who dream, as Psalm 126 tells us. Our mouths are filled with laughter, our tongue with shouts of joy. Thus Abraham fell on the ground laughing when told by God that he, a 100-year-old man, would have a child by 90-year-old Sarah. That was when Abraham laughed. And then later herself, Sarah herself laughed, as we've just heard. God specified to Abraham that the child of promise would be named laughter. Isaac means laughter. Your wife shall bear you a son and you shall call his name laughter and I will establish my covenant with him. Was this a penalty imposed upon them because they laughed? Hardly. Rather, it was a perpetual reminder that God breaks through. And that brings us to the central question really and it's the question regarding the promise because in verse 14 the question is asked is anything too hard for the Lord reading from verse 13 then the Lord said to Abraham why did Sarah laugh and say well I really have a child now that I'm old is anything too hard for the Lord I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. So, is anything too hard for the Lord? 
Well, that's the question that comes up again and again in the Bible. It comes up again and again in history, and it comes up for us too. And it's a question that we have to ask ourselves. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Because the answer to that question is really significant for us if we are, call ourselves people of faith. Because if we say yes, some things are too hard for the Lord, then God is simply not God. Jesus, of course, said otherwise. Life, his life, his death, his resurrection speak the opposite. They say that nothing is too hard for God. Nations over the centuries, people have prayed. The king called the nation to pray uh, here in Britain at the beginning of the Second World War. You may have heard of the Chilean miners who were trapped under the ground literally for, for months. And I'm sure many people had given up hope, that they, and they themselves had given up hope that they would ever be found. But what did they do? They prayed. And they were found. They were rescued. Every single one of them was rescued. Even small things like losing your keys. Every time I lose my keys, I honestly pray that I'm going to find them. And as various people in my family and others will testify, I do lose my keys quite a lot, but they always turn up. When I'm lost, I pray. I remember recently, I was on my way to a funeral somewhere in South London. I was taking this funeral and I got lost in my car and I was really concerned. I stopped the car and I just prayed. I drove out of that road and then suddenly I realized that I was very near where I needed to be. There's lots of examples of prayer, much more serious than that like lives being changed, people being delivered and freed from addictions and being set on a new path. That's the power of prayer. And that's the promise of God when we put our trust in Him. Faith isn't always so easy. It does involve suffering. Jesus Himself, even with all the victory of His ultimate victory of His life and death and resurrection, He Himself suffered in order to win for us that victory. And in fact, even in Mark chapter 14, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says to God, take this cup from me. If it's possible, please take it away. And God says, no, it's not possible. Because he had to go through that to actually fulfill God's purposes, which were much, much greater than Jesus, even in that terrible moment being able to not go to the cross. God is true to his promise. Abraham and Sarah, they said, no, God can't do this. But in spite of all that, God still did keep his promise. And I just want to finish now by reading finally from Genesis chapter 21, verses one to six. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became present, pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight day, day, days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Ab Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everybody who hears about this will laugh with me. We're now going to just have a, a moment of reflection and quiet. I'm going to uh, play a song, which uh, in fact is, is Tim singing and there'll be some images that will appear on the screen. And I'd ask you just to use this time as a, a time of quiet reflection as we listen to the song.
From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head And I will sing Of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been your voice and you have led me through the fire in darkest nights you were close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness the goodness of God and I will sing the goodness of God The harvest is plentiful but the workers are few Ask the Lord of the harvest therefore to send out workers into his harvest field Please join me now as we do that Heavenly Father we thank you and we recognise that you are the Lord of the harvest uh, Lord, that you are the one calling people to yourself. And Lord, we also recognise that there is a harvest. And Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes uh, to see the harvest all around us, Lord, that there are uh, there is a, a dying world needing to hear the gospel, needing to hear the good news. And Lord, that you would stir us up, you'd remind us that we are your labourers to go out into the field, into our workplaces, into schools, into our communities, into our local spheres of influence, wherever we find ourselves, Lord. Uh, Lord, that we would be the, your labourers, willing and desiring to bring the good news to people all around us, that they would be able to come and to know you. So let us pray to the Lord, who is our refuge uh, and, and stronghold for health and well-being for our nation, uh, that all who are fearful and anxious would be at peace and free from worry. Lord, we know that you hear us. For the isolated and housebound, we pray for them, that they would uh, may be alert to that we may be alert to their needs and care for them in their vulnerability. Lord, would you hear us? For our homes and families, our schools and young people, and all in any kind of need or distress, Lord, we know that you hear us. We pray for a blessing on our local community that our neighbourhoods may be places of trust and friendship where all are known and cared for. Lord, we know you hear us. Almighty God, source of our life, we acknowledge you as creator of all people and of every race, language and way of life. Help us see each other as you see us, your sons and daughters, loved into being and sustained by your parental care. 
Keep watch over our hearts so that the evil of racism will find no home within us. Direct our spirits to work for justice and peace so that all barriers to your grace which oppress our brothers and sisters will be removed in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we are in troubling and difficult times. Lord, we're in challenging times. Lord, as we look around the world and we see the effects of sin, particularly, Lord, as we see the racial injustice, uh, Lord, we see what's happened to not just to George Floyd, but many others, uh, Lord, who have suffered at the hands of um, racism, racial injustice. And Lord, we see that this pandemic of sin, this pandemic of racism, uh, Lord, um, has reared its ugly head. And, and actually, we're realising that it's, for many, in many ways, has never gone away. And Lord, we don't want to be blind to it, Lord. We don't want to pretend that it's not there, Lord. We want to be, as your people, Lord, we want to be aware uh, of the situation, Lord. We want to um, be ready and willing to come alongside those who are suffering, those who have been hurt, um, not just in the States, but right here at home. Those of us who have experienced uh, racism, Lord, um, friends and family and, and colleagues and people all around us, Lord, who've experienced uh, racial injustice. And, and, and so, Lord, we, we pray that you would be working in our hearts, Lord, that we would be willing uh, to stay with and have difficult and challenging conversations. Uh, Lord, that we would be willing to listen. Lord, that we would we'd humbly come before you and pray, Lord, and, and, and even repent and ask your forgiveness, Lord, for where maybe we have turned a blind eye to racism and to injustice. Lord, where maybe we have harboured injustice and indifference and prejudice in our own hearts, even maybe to this day. Lord, we want to acknowledge our sinfulness in this, Lord, and, 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 and pray and ask your forgiveness. Lord, I ask that you would search our hearts, as David said, to see if there's any wicked way within us. Lord, that you would really give us a heart for those who are hurting and who are suffering because of racial injustice. Lord, we pray for uh, the family uh, of all of those in the States, Lord, who have lost so many family members um, due to police brutality. Um, and Lord, we think about uh, close to home here, Lord, so many also who have suffered and even died at the, at the hands of injustice because of the colour of their skin. And so, Lord, we pray that there would be not a running away from the issue, actually, Lord, but a, a willingness to stand and listen um, and to, to humbly come before you and to humbly come around each other, to, to, to be prepared to ask difficult questions and to also feel difficult questions, to lovingly engage in the conversation and Lord, we pray that as your church, we would lead the way of, of, as those who have been reconciled with our God and also reconciled with one another. Lord, that we would lead the way, uh, pointing people, leading people to you as the only solution for racial reconciliation. The only, the only, only true race, racial reconciliation that's going to take place is, is in Christ. You alone can bring that, Lord. But would you help us along the way, Lord? Would you help us to begin to take seriously and look seriously at ourselves and at this issue and uh, Lord to acknowledge our part in it where that's the case but also to be willing to come alongside and be agents of change. Lord we thank you for the protests that have been taking place for the peaceful protests and Lord we pray that they would uh, continue and that, that this whole movement would continue in peace. Uh, Lord we pray against all those who have been uh, taking advantage of this situation, Lord, for, and for the violence that's come about, Lord, we pray that you would um, uh, cause people to uh, turn away from violence and turn towards you. Um, and so, Lord, we just pray for peace on our streets, Lord, pray that this wouldn't cause further uh, racial unrest, but actually, Lord, in the, in the, in the difficult conversations that, we, that we we're going to have, Lord, I pray that real solutions and change would come from it. And so, Lord, we commit ourselves to you, realising that this is above and beyond us. And Lord, we know that you've caused us to be people to speak up and to stand out against all injustice, including racial injustice. And so, Lord, we commit ourselves to you uh, as the Lord of the harvest. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be those who take this good news um, to a harvest that is waiting to hear it. Lord, that we would be those who come alongside people uh, willing to cry with, um, to 
to, to bear the burden and pain that people have gone through, to, to really hear and listen to people where people are coming from. And Lord, that we would point people to you. We pray for healing in our land, for healing in, in America, Lord, healing all across this globe. Uh, Lord, that your gospel would go forth, Lord, and that you would reconcile mankind to you and to each other. In Jesus' name, amen.
Our service this morning is over. Thank you so much for joining us. And before we depart to go on to whatever the week has to offer for us this week, I wonder if we could all say the grace together, even if it may not be at exactly the same time, exactly the same place, on exactly the same device, we'll know that we're still united as the church family. So we say together, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.